Mark is a real innovator. Um, when it comes to raising wholesome, healthy food for his customer. And Mark believes that healthy soil equals healthy And basically, I think that you're going to really enjoy this here. I just have one comment here that is, um, you know, while some of Mark's pictures may be at a scale that may be a little bit bigger than some of you that are at, um, all principles apply, even if you're a home gardener. Well, look at the type of cover crop that he's using, the techniques that he's using, and um, don't let the size intimidate you if that's the, if, the, if that's the case. I know a lot of us um, are growers out here, and that won't bother. I just make that comment. So again, started here. Just take sure. Well, Terry always has such kind words. Um, Terry is kind of the champion in the state of Minnesota for all that he's done to, to help high tunnels and, and farms across the whole state. Um, when he was talking, he was cutting out some, and so I hope I'm not. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. You can, and I'm not cutting out. Okay, great. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so we'll get back to the cover crop slide. Great. Wonderful. Um, you know, the older I get, the more I realize what happens underneath the soil is probably the greatest part of creation. And so that's what we'll be talking about tonight. And so our title is Cover Crops, Making Royal Soil. And, um, and, and our business got started way back in 1978. I was an elementary teacher in Fergus Falls. I did that wonderful job for 34 years. Uh, and, um, in 2009, I hit the rule of 90, and I kind of reluctantly left um, the teaching field because um, I wanted our business at home to kind of grow and explode, um, which it did. Um, um, I, rule of 90 means when you look like you're 90, they just open the door and let you go. It's kind of cool how that works. But notice back at that time in 1978, my little dog and I, we were just sitting in the chair because this was a terrible time to start a vegetable business because everybody had their own garden. And so my little dog, Scooter, who uh, who came to my second grade classroom as a, as a box of show and tell puppies, one of them sat in the corner looking straight up at me and that became, that was little Scooter that's in my lap and what a dear dog that was. But as we sat there day after day, week after week, cars did begin to stop and people started to say, you know what, I think we're gonna make you be our garden and we're gonna do flowers instead. So our stand business with tons and tons of persistence um, grew. And, and so we had like two to three stands in the Fergus area and we had stands in Fargo, Moorhead and Breckenridge and Wapiton, um, Pelican Rapids, Battle Lake, Underwood, um, we even went through an era where we had self-serve stands and just believing that people are so good. We had a metal box that people would put the money in after they had made their purchase. And, and letting the stands be unmanned allowed us to have more stands and have longer hours. And we, we tripled our business, you know, by believing in people. Um, there comes a point with anything where some learn to take advantage of that. And so we, we wound up going back demand stands and um, we had pickups shooting off in every direction every day and and the only trouble with stands which are very very good is that so much still comes back and I always thought if we could just sell what we raise you know the farm would make it and so it was out of out of despair that that the CSA you know was born on our farm and so the CSA is a connection with People, people sign up to be a member of our farm this time of year, um, and then in return, they are members of our farm. They get a weekly box of our produce. Uh, they take part on our farm and harvest events, and, and our goal is to connect people to the farm where their food is growing. And so our farm evolved. For 30-some years, we did the stands, uh, and then we had the painful little transition where we did stands and the CSA and the pasture fair chicken. <laughs> so that was a, a very um, 
stress filled time with with more than we can handle and and after two years of doing pasture fed chickens um, we we um, gave them up and and um, learned that focus was a good word and so from 2012 and on we're we're merely doing the CSA and so we generally have about a 2,000 member CSA. But then, guess what happened the summer of 2013? Um, that was the one where there was no spring. Well, there wasn't one last year either, was there? But there was no spring. There was a foot of rain in like May and early June, and, and um, soil erosion was happening, and it was like stress. How in the world are we going to fill those boxes when there is no weather to support doing that? And so we actually, just due to the stress, you know, after doing this 30 some years, even put our farm up momentarily for sale, thinking, wow, we can't do this anymore. But then as the summer went on, I was thinking, you know, but what if? And so so one day, one day I had my whole staff go across the highway on some land that wasn't ours and said, you know what we need to do? We need to get <laughs> more land. I mean, what logic is there in that? And, but anyway, more land where we can do alternating strips of crop and cover crop over our whole farm because our weather has changed and it's more extreme and 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 cover crops is just a beautiful way to combat what nature has now become and so that was you know exciting it's funny how good you know comes out of bad and so so there's there's that very same land this summer where you see the alternating strips of crop and cover crop, and so it was kind of our chance to make it happen. I got more joy all summer out of watching those strips grow, and just the beauty of strip farming, you know, is, is something that I um, will never get enough of seeing. And so here's here's a good example of um, a field that shows those 80 foot strips. And so the one where the arrow was that had squash all summer long, winter squash. So did this strip right here. Um, and so we planted our winter squash on about six or seven of those 80 foot strips, um, 80 foot wide that is. And, and then, oh, about mid July, we planted clovers in amidst the squash. Once, um, once we had done the last cultivation of corn, it was a good time to put the clovers in there. And so right now, at this moment, those clovers are, are, um, are they are ready to grow back next spring. But then you see these green strips, and and they were our cover crop strips. Um, they they were going to have field peas and oats first, but there was no spring, so that didn't have time for that. But then they were Sudan grass, which we'll be talking about as the night goes on. Sudan grass, and then vetch and rye and field radish is what they are now when they're green in probably the month of November is when this picture was taken. So our goals tonight are to just talk about the covers of the categories, excuse me, of cover crops and our favorite ones, um, but then what we're doing on the cover crop strips. So in other words, if you have a piece of land that's only going to be cover cropped, what could be a possible sequence? But then since we want to have our cake and eat it too, you know, if all, if the only room you have is for vegetable crops, you can also do cover crops before, during, and after the vegetable crop. And that's really exciting as well. And so that's, that's our goals for tonight. And feel free as we go along to ask questions. Cover crops go by many names. Um, of course, they're called cover crops because they cover the earth. They cover the soil. They protect it from pounding rain and raging wind, I mean, and so they're called cover crops. Nature never wants to leave the ground uncovered. Nature always keeps ground covered. Even in the mountains, you know, where, um, where the trees grow out of little cracks, you know, nature is determined to cover the earth with its cover crops. But cover crops are also called um, green manure crops. You know, it's another substitute for manure, where you raise a crop and work it into the soil, and it becomes what we call uh, a green manure. And so instead of cow pies, we have cow peas, you know, planted in our field. But cover crops are also called catch crops. They do just a marvelous job of holding nutrients. Um, 
because the, the folding of the nutrients keeps them from being washed away. Um, it's part of the workings with biology that allows it to do that, whether the crop is growing or even after it's tilled in, cover crops are, are hanging on to those minerals and nutrients in the soil, it's what, which is what you know our, our, our country needs to keep things like the hypoxy zone in the Gulf of Mex Mexico from, from happening. So as far as the types of cover crops, there are certainly the legumes, you know, um, and they're the ones that make nitrogen, take it right out of the air, and back the air they take it out of is in that soil, but, but it's all the clovers, you know, it's cow peas, field peas, vetch, um, and, and they're the ones that provide just an incredible feast, you know, of nutrients for the crop that follows them, and so bacteria. Uh, really love legumes because they're softer and easier to di digest. And the one thing they don't do a lot of is build organic matter in the soil, but they certainly make nutrition, you know, happen. And then we have the non-legumes. They're the ones that are a little tougher to break down. They're the ones that fungi like. They are things like all of the grains, rye, um, cereal rye, sudan grass, corn, sorghum, um, buckwheat, all of those. And, and they decompose more slowly, and they then do add organic matter to the soil. And so they'll, um, the bacteria and fungi, while eating those, will will use will hang on, will use the nitrogen and tie it up a bit. Um, but you certainly want non-legumes too to build up that organic matter in the soil. And then we have the brassica. This is a picture of one of our sealed radishes this this fall. I mean, just see uh, how beautiful it is out of the ground, and just as much of that radish is below ground too, making this incredible tunnel into the soil, reducing compaction. Um, but brassicas are just wonderful at, um, at hanging on to nutrients and scavenging them and suppressing weeds, and, and in some cases, um, uh, destroying soil-borne pests such as nematodes. And so um, brassicas such as the mustards and the field radish and canola, are a, a cool part too of cover crops you might decide to use. So which category would we use? Legumes or non-legumes or brassicas? Well, we love to use them all. Um, so in other words, a mixture of many. This particular crop we had planted here a few years ago was called nitro mix, and it has ten different um, plant different plants, you know, within that one planting. And, and as we get into the talk about biology, you know, each plant, you know, attracts its own biology. So it's making the soil, you know, rich in diversity. And so it's kind of nice to do cocktail mixes because then you get the benefits of everything. So some of our favorites, um, I absolutely love vetch and rye. This picture was taken in December. Um, you see the field radishes are dying, but the vetch and the rye um, of course, the rye are these grass, grassy ones, and the vetches are the frilly, frilly ones. Vetch will make up to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Isn't that exciting? Uh, and up to 5,000 pounds of dry organic matter. It's a nitrogen source, a weed suppressor, conditions the soil, and reduces erosion. And rye is just a champion as a cover crop. Uh, makes up to 10,000 pounds of dry matter per acre. Uh, and, and just does so much to help build up the soil. So rye is just an incredible one. And then Sudan grass too is a favorite of ours, up to 18,000 pounds of organic matter per acre. Um, when we would, um, when we dissed it under for the, for the final event, um, the, the soil on those Sudan grass strips was like, oh, six inches to 12 inches taller than the, soil in the surrounding area just because of all the organic matter in that soil. And so an amazing book, um, Managing Cover Crops Profitably, will say that that one will fix up your soil, you know, in, in no time. So sedan grass is one of our favorites. Field peas, especially if planted with oats, just work wonders. They're a nitrogen source, uh, do so many good things. And then oats. This is not a small tractor in the, in the oats. This is a 105 horse tractor. We were soft chopping it at that time. And so um, anytime, you know, we plant field peas and oats, I tell you the soil 
following that is totally royal. It is so soft and full of matter and so ready to accept growth that it's just exciting. And we really like field radish too. Um, you you want to get it planted, you know, before the end of August because otherwise it doesn't have enough time to grow. But we'll we'll just um, just um, add so much matter to the soil. This winter now, when it would get a little mild, you'd smell the rotting radish, which is such a rich, you know, earthy smell. And so um, field radish will make soil mellow and followed by just a great gain in earthworms. And buckwheat, too, is an amazing one. It's such a fast grower. Six to eight weeks you can do a crop of buckwheat in, in the middle of summer and, and um, add as much matter in the root below, you know, as it does on the top. So many times we look at cover crops and think, oh, everything on that top, but boy, the roots are just a huge part of um, the matter that's brought to the soil. Um, we haven't done mustard yet. We certainly plan to. <laughs> we want all the neighbors to come by our farm and say, oh my gosh, would you look at the mustard in that field, because they would think it's a weed and not a cover crop. But up to 9,000 pounds of dry matter per acre and scavenge is like 120 pounds of nitrogen and, and um, a, a good fast grower as well. And then all the clovers, you just can't beat them. We have done red clover in the past. Uh, sweet clover is just an amazing one. It will it will get roots like up to five feet deep, you know, in the soil. Talk about a compaction fighter. And then up to eight feet tall on the top, you know, and just a beautiful haven for bees. And so, so clovers, especially sweet clover, are a favor of ours. This yellow blossom sweet clover seed is so cheap too compared to the others, so we we like that one. And then if you want any kind of grazing and want a short clover, you can't beat white Dutch clover. Uh, I remember when we did have chickens, it was by far their favorite, and you would just hear the little leaves snapping off as the chickens were dining on clover. But a good one for orchards too. It comes back year after year, of course, and just help keeps building up the soil and supplying nitrogen. So white Dutch clover is a favorite of ours. Isn't that a beautiful picture of laying hens eating white Dutch clover, right? It's like the best egg in the world, you know, when they're out there eating, uh, grazing to for their diet. Incredible. So um, we're going to talk about the cover crop strips first, and that's if you um, – you know, are only doing cover crops on a piece of land. And, and ideally what would have happened is you would have gotten them, gotten them planted the fall before with batch and rye. Um, we planted deep into the fall this year. It'll be a good experiment as to who survives because here we have this winter with little snow cover and a lot of breaks in dormancy. Um, but many of them were planted in August. And I tell you, those cover crops look so good because they have so much vegetative growth growth on top that will help, you know, the extremes in temperature that are happening without snow cover. Um, and and so so then the vetch and rye would come back this, the following spring, you know, and and by late May to early June it will reach reproductive stage, which is the best time to stop chop it and possibly till it in. But sometimes you may need the crop sooner than that, and even if you have to take a crop sooner than that, um, even even the non-legumes will give you nitrogen in the soil if you take them like in early May before before their time. Um, but if if you don't have a cover crop planted before fall, my very favorite is is field peas and oats. Um, in this case, we're stock chopping that. Um, you can see by the picture our wheel speed should have been a little slower because then it would have done a better job of cutting. Um, you know, we're learning that the less we disturb the soil, the less we hurt the biology. So instead of battering it with a disc or repeated tillings to try to break that cover crop into bits, why not chop it up first? Um, if you didn't use a stock chopper, if you didn't have one, any kind of a mower will be great, a whale mower. 
we did Sudan dresses sure with a sickle mower. Um, you know, anything, you know, to break it up is a wonderful thing. So for cover crop strips in the spring, vetch and rye and field peas and oats, isn't that just beautiful? You see, um, you see the, the field peas right in there and then the oats, of course. Uh, that, that soil on that field was so soft to walk on. And then we followed it with vetch and rye because it was, after all, a, a cover crop strip and field radish, too. It's just beautiful. I mean, we, all of us as gardeners or farmers, we, we just know what good soil feels like. And, and having a cover crop in it is exactly what that looks like. We're, um, this was a strip of field peas and oats a number of years ago, and we were tilling it in, and we're, we're, we're getting away from tilling. In fact, it's going to stay in the shed because we are learning more and more that the more you batter your soil, the more you destroy the home for the biology, which is what this is all about. But, but even then, this, this crop or this land was so soft following that, and a heavy rain came and, and not a speck of soil washed away because it all just soaked in due to that wonderful cover crop. So um, we're, um, that one's going to stay in the shed next summer. Um, a disc is a little less destructive, but we do want to stock chop it first because that lets us have to disc it less. Um, and and uh, I mean, if we can do it in one pass, we're thrilled. Cause I, used to, I mean, all of us as farmers love to till and till and till. And we were at the Minnesota Organic Conference this last week, and oh my gosh, they're they're showing all the destruction that happens with tilling, and so we're yikes. It's, <laughs> That's a hard one to take when it's something one loves to do so much. Um, so now we're talking about cover crop strips in the summer. So following the field peas and oats or oats or the vetch and the rye, then you can plant with some good summer cover crops. And this, of course, is Sudan grass. The minute it's warm, you can plant Sudan grass. It grows quickly in warm weather. And, and does just amazing things. You know, it's probably one of the most stellar cover crops there is. And so there's that same tractor, but this time in a field of Sudan grass, and we're stock chopping that. And and the cool thing that happens with Sudan grass is if you mow it or stock chop it, um, magical things happen. One is all that organic matter is laying on top of the soil. But also, then it begins to regrow, and when it regrows, it grows a whole new set of roots, twice as deep as the first. So just imagine the organic matter you're putting in the soil through the roots as well. And so as it grows a whole new, deeper set of roots, it reduces compaction. And it's, it's pretty magic. Um, and so there's another picture showing um, there's a patch of of sweet corn, but then right next to it, the cover crop strip. And so we're stock chopping the Sudan grass so it can grow one more time. And so there it is. There's the Sudan grass regrowing. You can see, um, like, the organic matter from the first cutting. This is probably a week later. Um, the first week you cut it, my gosh, everything looks brown, and you'd think you'd kill the whole works. Um, but then, right out of the root, not out of the old stems, no, but right out of the root, new um, Sudan grass is growing, and there it goes again. And so we're thinking, should there be a good growing season again, a nice, warm, wet one? I think we could get probably um, three Sudan grass crops, you know, in one season. Last year we had two. And so then in, in when it was time to take it under so we could plant the next cover crop, we, we didn't stop chop it. And now I wish, you know, we had because we realized that biology, you know, doesn't want to eat a whole long stem of Sudan grass. And we probably had to disc it twice. So, so uh, we're, we're learning as we go that, that to chop it up all the time, you know, is a good thing. And so, but we also learned that we spent a lot of time trying to get it ready, which made us plant our um, cover crops a little later than we wanted, because using the disc as beautiful as it was, you know, 
wasn't as, as efficient. So our so our John Deere um oh so our, our friends at, at RDO John Deere brought out that for this for us to try and and it would help us, you know, just incorporate it a lot faster so that the fall cover crop could get planted faster and have a better chance of surviving the winter. So we we might be looking at that um, just to make things more efficient. Um, so it is a hard thing, you know, you hear talk against it. Um, they, I mean, they say the, the vertical tillage causes less harm than than other things, um, but but still, we we heard um, an amazing person talk about how the the fungi high foot high feet throughout the soil will get wrecked every time you till. So that made us start thinking. Um, well, and this is back to the stock chopping. Just like like we don't eat a whole beef at a time. You know, we also want them to to chop up our cover crop before it goes in the soil, so they can have one stake at a time instead of the whole cow. So our week at the Minnesota Organic Conference got us to thinking, you know what, we need more than that fish chisel. It's maybe uh, a planter that would be no-till. In other words, probably all early August, we would stock chop the Sudan grass and then plant the fall cover crop right in that Sudan grass without destroying it. And so the vetch and the rye and and the field radish would get direct seeded right into that Sudan grass crop. And then we'd be real careful to not let the Sudan grass get too tall so that it wouldn't choke out the new seedlings coming up. But then what would happen in the winters would be a lot more cover on top, cover to hold the snow, cover to keep that cold away, you know, from the new cover crop. So so it's funny, all of us as farmers we evolve because we keep thinking. And for us, going to conferences helps us just open our mind and see things outside the box. So we've been talking about summer cover crops, um, and, and Sudan grass, obviously, is one of our favorites. Um, nitro mix. Nitro mix is the one that has, like, field peas and vetch and brucine clover and cow peas. And then the non-legumes, like millet oats and sunflower and brassicas, like field radish and turnip. And we got that mixture through um, through Agassiz seeds. They're out of Fargo, and, and locally we got it through the country store um, in Kurt's Swamp. And so we, we love we love the nitro mix. You want to plant it early in the summer to give it plenty of chance to grow. But another good summer cover crop, you know, that's just a fast one is is buckwheat. Buckwheat does so much to make your soil mellow. Um, buckwheat. Is just a, a champion above and below the ground. Um, what we learned too was that it's just an incredible phosphorus scavenger and produces two to three tons of dry matter in just such a short time, six to eight weeks. So then we get to fall. You know, what could we do in the fall after the sedan grass or the or the nitro mix or the buckwheat's done? Well. As soon as you can, you know, to get a fall one planted, which would most likely be vetch, rye, and field radish. We're looking for others that might survive the winter, and it just seems to be as far north as we are, these are the ones that would do the best. And and we kind of learned firsthand this year, boy, earlier, earlier is so much better than waiting. So this was some sample of the field I showed before. This is the one with, uh, it had squash, but it's clovers. And then here's the vetch and the rye going into winter. The squash patch again with the clovers and the vetch and the rye. That just repeats across our whole farm. There's no more gorgeous sight for me than to see those strips, you know, from afar. It's absolutely beautiful. And so that's what we would plant for the fall, the vetch and the rye. This was this was mid-December. You see some of the little vetches that were above the snow line you know, frozen died, but where it really lives throughout the winter is in the roots. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a nail biter with such a, an extreme winter, hoping that everybody survives. But we walk out in the field often and, it, and it's looking good, you know, so far. And so um, the next spring then, rye will become chest high and vetch will grow 12 foot vines. You know, it's, 
it's one that you want to get taken care of before it gets woody or, or it's, it's quite a mess is, is what happens. So. And so this is why they're called cover crops. If you look at this field here, um, those things sticking through the snow, they're not clumps of dirt. No, they are cover crops that are protecting the soil and holding the snow. The picture on the left is um, of a neighboring farm. This happened on my farm for way too many years too, but after a fierce wind, guess what happens? All that dirt soil blows off the field and lands on the top of snow banks. And, and so what a good feeling when the wind blows to have them covered with cover crops. So now we're talking about vegetable strips. Um, so um, if, if you only have room on your farm to, to just keep doing vegetables or in your garden, uh, you, you still can do cover crops. And, and of course, in, just like with the cover crop strips, if you have vetch and rye planted this, the fall before, then it comes back in the spring and maybe it's kind of a cranky wet spring. Well, guess what the vetch and rye can just start growing again and not need you to be out in the field. So you get a, a gain on growth, you know, compared to if you had to go out and plant something. And so it's done a vegetable strip, so you have to decide when you want to take it down, you know, and you have to take it down when you need it. And one thing to watch for is, is once you've worked it in, give it a little time before you plant your next crop because it will tie up the nitrogen. Oh, I wish, um, okay, um, field peas and oats is such a favorite one of ours, and, and the movie won't play um, just, just because it's on this conference call, but it's, um, it's uh, a field of peas and oats, field peas and oats, and strips were tilled through the field peas and oats uh, to plant pumpkins in, and so beside the strips of Pumpkins were these tall field peas and oats where where they got later crimped down and laid down as a flat bed so that the squash could grow out and bind out onto the the nice bed of of um, straw that would be in between the rows. Um, we also are starting to like to just lightly till it and then follow with clover planting too. But but if you're if your garden is bare in the spring and you didn't get vetch and rye in, boy, you can't beat, can't beat field peas and oats. That's probably my favorite combination. So another option within your vegetable crop is, um, is, is to plant clovers with your vegetable crop. Just like we had field peas and oats in between the rows of squash, um, clovers were planted in this tomato field. And so you see the dead tomatoes. It was the end of the season. We had already mowed the tomatoes. And then there's all the little clovers that are going to come back next spring and make just a huge burst of nitrogen, you know, for the following crop that comes after it. And so we kind of learned, you know, we did this planting in August just because we weren't ready. But the minute you're done with your last cultivation, get those clovers out in the field. And, and um, all we did after after sowing them with a little whirly bird was uh, was irrigate and, and they were off and growing. So just a simple watering will get them tucked into the soil. Uh, this is a sample of clovers in a squash field, the uh, winter squash. And so you see all the dying squash vines in the fall. We, we mowed over the top of them and then there are the clovers. And so these two were planted in August, and, and we know now, you know, it's got to be earlier on any cover crop is better, so it's, it's, we want it to be um, mid-July instead. And so clovers will make up to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Nitrogen made artificially takes just tons of propane and tons of resources, you know, and so why not, why not let cover crops do it instead? Hey Mark, this is yeah. doing a great job. I'm having a, I'm hearing from one one of our people um, that's trying to watch through a computer to a television sure. and is having a hard time hearing. Okay. So, um, 
I don't know if, yeah, maybe if you just sit closer. <laughs> sure. Let's just try that. I'll do that. Sorry. Thanks for letting me know. Yep. So a cyclone feeder, which is three-point hitch, um, can be used for spreading um, clovers. Um, we've, um, and, and for the tomatoes and the squash, we actually use a handheld one that you can buy at Fleet Farm. But we've also learned for any cover crop, a grain drill, you know, does such a better job. But, but any way you can get it on your, your field is, is going to be great. Look at that beautiful picture with the fog in the background. Um, we're thinking for next year just to be efficient, a bigger grain drill, you know, would be of help. And then, of course, after any vegetable crop. Instantly plant vetch and rye and field radish um, and that can happen right within the vegetable crop. We've, we've learned that um, you know you want to have just little fallow time and, and get um, roots back in that soil because that's what the biology needs to, to hang on to and so um, so you can really get a lot of cover crops planted when you're done with a vegetable crop. So why bother with cover crops? Well, certainly there's weed suppression. Um, I went to the Moses Organic Conference like always last year, and I went to a class where they gave the top 10 reasons um, to fight weeds or ways to fight weeds. And, and it was interesting. The, the last on the list, the poorest way to fight weeds was, and you won't guess it, but it was cultivation. And the best way to fight weeds, according to that session, was was cover crops. You know, why would cover crops fight weeds? Well, for one thing, cover crops will smother them out and not let them, um, you know, take hold and grow and make seeds. Um, but Another way they do it is they make the soil healthy, and nature is so phenomenal and so amazing that um, it has weeds grow for a reason. It has weeds grow because the soil isn't healthy and it's out of balance or it's compacted. And, and once cover crops start taking care of those needs, weeds don't need to grow. Um, another reason they suppress weeds is because um, you get so much biology happening in the soil, which will eat the wheat seeds. Um, when biology eats those, they're like eating their wheaties. Um, so that's how that works. Um, but cover crops also retain nutrients and, and keep all those nutrients in the soil and keep recycling them throughout the soil and definitely improves soil quality and tilth and reduces erosion and adds nitrogen, which is amazing, improves water quality, and conserves soil moisture. Um, our, our hope with our, our, our new cover crop plan is that we'll be um, needing to irrigate a lot less, and we'll be holding those obscene rains that now seem to come every spring. Uh, but, but then the drought that always now seems to follow those incredible rains uh, when I was young, you used to get like a half inch every week, and, and those those days are gone. Now the weather is extreme, and so so we're hoping cover crops will moderate those brutal extremes and cut fertilizer costs. But but the biggest the biggest reason to have cover crops is that nothing 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 improves soil fertility more than organic matter in the soil. Organic matter makes the soil porous, allowing biology to live, and organic matter feeds the biology. Um, it's all about the biology in the soil. I mean, it's not about, certainly not about me, and it's not even about cover crops. It's all about biology, all the life that lives in the soil, and that's what makes all the magic happen, you know, within the soil. Um, we'll never wrap our tiny human brain 
you know, around the magic that happens in the soil. For example, plants give off 80 to 70 percent of their energy to feed the biology in the soil. So out of their roots comes this gooey, soft substance um, called exodites that feed the biology. And why would they give all that energy to feed biology in the soil, the bacteria, the fungi, the actinomycetes, and earthworms? Why would they do that? Well, it's because in return, the, the bacteria and the fungi will chew up organic matter and chew up minerals and deliver it to the plant. But it's a, a magical symbiotic dance, you know, that happens between the plant and the biology and the soil. And so, for example, if the plant thinks it needs a certain nutrient, it'll give off a different flavor of exodites, attracting the bacteria that won't get them that nutrient. I mean, do you think God was thinking, or was he thinking when he put all that together? It's, it's simply amazing. But in addition to the cover crops, one has to take a look at um, the chemistry of the soil. So where we live in, in um, northeast of Fergus Falls, Minnesota, we have, we have clay loam soil, heavy clay loam soil that, that's um, high in magnesium and low in calcium. And what that does is it makes some really hard, tight soil. And so, so we have to address that chemically too. And so what we need to do is to add calcium. Right now we're in the process of adding more high calcium lime to the soil to help open up the soil and make it more porous. Um, we want the ratio to be eight to one of, of calcium to magnesium in the soil. Um, and then what does calcium do? Oh my gosh, it does everything. Um, it improves soil structure. It's kind of the traffic cop in the center of the intersection, brings the other elements into line, stimulates soil microbes and earthworms, mobilizes nutrients. I mean, it just is the chief ruler, you know, in the soil, makes root and leaf growth happen, cell division, strengthens cell walls, and, and what's really cool improves enzyme functions. But it also helps your plants make um, a higher sugar content. And, and so, for example, 15 years ago when we learned about calcium and started um, um, adding it to our fields, we had people all over say, wow, you have the best sweet corn we've ever had, you know, and so that just told us the power of calcium. It also made our soil soft and rich and you could just see the life, you know, in the soil whenever you would dig potatoes or do something like that. So this is a picture of me just a couple of years ago at the county fair. Um, and you can see I, I haven't aged at all. That day, um, that day on the radio, they said, everyone, just, just drive your old cars to the fair. And so that's what they did, look at all the old cars there um, that day. But anyway, my, my grandfather and my dad were amazing farmers. And we had dairy farm, of course, and, and always would have the rotations that made good things happen. And, put manure back on the fields. But in the fall, every year when we would plow it up, guess what? It was hard, tight lumps, you know? And, and what we didn't know back then was that we were high in magnesium and low in calcium. And, and so I was the one that got to ride on that little tandem disc with the H formal that tried to smooth out those lumps. And, and now I know there's a better way. It's, it's, it's called calcium, you know, in our soil. And so who is this biology? Well, it's certainly the earthworms. If, if your soil has earthworms, you are lucky indeed. Uh, earthworms do so much, they improve soil structure. And so they improve water filtration and absorption. Um, they give off, if you have 25 earthworms per acre, and the last time we counted, we had 23, your earthworms are making 40 tons of castings daily, and those castings hold and absorb water. Um, they also improve soil fertility. I mean, they will stimulate microbes and chelate minerals. And what comes out of the back end of an earthworm is like three times more rich in nutrients than what went in. I'm not sure how they do that, but 
holy crap, you know, is all we can say to that. And they also just help plant growth happen. Um, the increased crop yields by 25 to 300%. Um, the, the earthworms will devour like mycorrhizal fungi and paste it on the side of the earthworm channels that they have. And then the roots will follow those channels and, and soak all the fungi up. I mean, it's just, it's just magical how, how things in the soil work. And so large earthworm populations suppress weeds. I think they're, they're tunneling and just their creation of health in the soil uh, makes weeds not need to grow. Um, they also eat weed seeds. I mean, that's another factor. And any biology, its first goal is to clean up toxins in the soil. They'll break any herbicide chains. And, um, and they improve water absorption and prevent erosion. Um, fields with earthworms absorb water 35 times more than fields without them. And with earthworms, a two-inch rain is absorbed in 12 minutes, but without it's 12 hours, isn't that something? Or a million earthworms per acre is like the equivalent space of 4,000 feet of six-inch drain tile per acre. And then there's the bacteria in the soil. Um, we always hear such bad things about bacteria, and there's hand sanitizers everywhere, but in the, in the soil, they're magic, you know, working with the plant roots. Um, that symbiotic dance that I've already talked about, chewing up organic matter and minerals, feeding on the plant's exodites, um, just an amazing exchange back and forth is what happens with all the bacteria in the soil. Uh, so many incredible things. And then there's the fungi, and every time we till, you know, we destroy the fungi, hyphae that go out into the soil, but fungi will latch onto the plant root and, and extend way beyond the plant root to, to gather water and minerals and, and any other nutrients for the plant. And so, so I've seen pictures of fields with fungi where in a drought, those plants aren't dry, whereas without fungi in a field, they're, they're dry. So I heard a fantastic person speak um, at the Minnesota Organic Conference about fungi and, and all that they do. And, and she really was recommending, you know, no-till, because every time you till, you know, you destroy all the high sea highways that fungi have throughout the soil. Fungi, you know, eat the coarser debris in the soil, but, but definitely are there to, to work with the plant as well. As far as possible ponds of life per acre, I mean, I look at, at the biology in the farm as like feeding one cow, you know, per acre. And so like 2,600 pounds of bacteria in a healthy acre of soil or 445 pounds of earthworms or algae, or nematodes, fungi, I mean, it's just amazing, you know, the life that there is in the soil. This one's really cool. Um, if plants don't rely on biology or have biology or, or um, don't have the minerals in the soil to work with, all they're going to make are simple sugars, like the top three on this list. And we are indeed, you know, an overfed, undernourished nation. Whereas, whereas if everything is cooking in the soil, the biology, the, the minerals, the, the everything, then the plant can all of a sudden make the lignans and the amino acids and the proteins, which is honestly where our health is at. And so one of the niches on our farm for our CSA members is, is and it's shown on five signs that go away from our driveway, it's bluebird gardens biologically farming for you because because what happens in the soil if we let it between the plants and, and the biology is, is, you know, a stunning thing and, and it results in flavor. Um, we hear from our members all the time that, that the flavor is just so much more than they experience, you know, from the other food they eat. 
So if you look at this picture, and boy, I'm not here to blast farmers. I think they're all champions. But here, this this field on a lighter soil, and the corn has been harvested, and now they're they're bailing up the corn stalks um, to leave the farm. And is there a problem with that picture? Well, they're getting some money for the bales, but the problem is. Nothing is more important to fertility than organic matter in the soil, and so, so what's going to be there, you know, in the years to come? Um, nothing. The soil will be just entirely empty. So that's so. So I mean, our job is to keep all of us adding organic matter to the soil, and vegetable farms aren't good at adding organic matter to the soil. So I'm definitely part of the problem, and I'm hoping our cover crop plan will help take care of that. Is there a problem in this picture? You know, well, look at all the drifting of the dirt in um, just one wind event. We, um, in our country, we lose five to 15 tons of topsoil per acre per year. I mean, isn't that something? And in the last 100 years, we have lost half of our topsoil. And so will we lose the other half in the next 100 years? You know, we can't. And is there a problem in this picture? And, and it's the hypoxy zone in the Gulf of Mexico because our soils can no longer hold the nutrients that we keep pouring on them. Um, what, what it takes is biology and organic matter in the soil to hold and reclaim and recycle those nutrients so we don't lose them. It's kind of funny if we give our plant too much phosphorus. I was just hearing this weekend, you're, the plant will think it has enough and it'll stop feeding the fungi in the soil that would have gathered the, the phosphorus naturally from the soil as it thinks it doesn't need it, so then the fungi will die. I mean, if that isn't sad, we have to take a strong look at what we're doing. Um, um, an, ex, an extra pound of nitrogen in the soil will take seven pounds of calcium away with it because it makes calcium nitrate, which just runs away, you know. And so um, is there a problem with this picture? Yeah, we have to let, we have to let biology rule. We have to let... Um, organic matter be in the soil and let nature, not us, let nature do what nature has a plan for. But <clears throat> is there an answer in this picture? Oh, yes. There is. So we, we could open it up for questions. Thank you, Mark. Wow, that was. See, we have five minutes to go. Can you believe that? <laughs> How about that? Yeah, you I talk too fast, and I hope everyone could hear me. I, I'm never ever sick, and I'm coming out of this cold this morning. I couldn't even talk, so I'm really okay. I have a little voice anyway. Yeah, I think there was some, I think there's just a technical glitch at that one site uh, trying to run a computer and a, uh, connect a computer and a television, and they just had trouble uh, getting the two to talk to each other. Okay, sure. So um, we can, what, Terry, do you want to, oh, I see, uh, I'm hearing the single signal for some. Oh yeah, that was just Terry texting uh, or chatting into the chat box. If anyone has any questions, uh, you can type them into that chat box. Or I think with the group that's on, um, you know, if if you want to take turns and uh, those of you who have a mic ask a question out loud, I think we can handle that. Um, I guess one question I have, Marco. Sure. 
you know, you're operating at a at a scale where you have a lot of equipment um, for a uh, for a much smaller garden. Um, you know, what might a what might a gardener do to uh, to chop up uh, chop up some of that material and make it ready for incorporating? Right. Exactly. Um, if you had any size tractor at all, I mean any size of tractor, small, it could be even a lawnmower, um, mm -hmm. a riding lawnmower or um, any kind of flail mower. Um, flail mowers are great, um, uh, but I mean that's what a lawnmower is too. Um, so I would say anything like that would work. And then, um, I mean, we, we started our business with a Troy built Troy built killer of Ford Pinto and a garden way cart. I mean, and so mm -hmm. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, it was years before we got a tractor where we could have a disc to actually work anything in. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I mean, we 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 as farmers or gardeners are also are creative and use whatever we can. Um, so yeah, I would say any kind of a mower you could find. Terry, you have any ideas on that? No, I know we have a lot of gardeners on, so I mean, I think you brought out some really good points, Mark, here. Um, the idea is to um, think ahead. Um, I know we're in the process of writing an article here on um, the managing the garden in the summer. And I think that this is a good place with the cover crops that we can um, we can look into that. A lot, sure. of the, a lot of the gardens have been in the same spot for years and years and years. And, um, you know, the weeds go to seed, and you know how that gets to be. You know, and isn't that true? And then it's just a vicious snowball down the hill. And so we haven't done this long enough to know, but what I've heard is if you really get cover crops growing, you'll raise twice as much off the land you are using. I mean, and so for some people, just cut your garden in half, and half of it's cover crop, and the other half um, is, is – um, is cropped or the strips, which we dearly love, you know, is a cool thing too. Um, yeah, interesting. It's really interesting as I grew up in southern Michigan, this cover crop technology was very, very prevalent in the vegetable industry back then. Uh, maybe not so much in the row crop. And as agriculture became more and more competitive for. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, for land and for dollars, um, we, we kind of went the way of the, um, it was a sinful, you know, commercial, you know, you know, operation, you know, good for the health of the soil for, for our, and ultimately our health. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. very well said. That's exactly it. Uh, anyone who's on the line who wants to ask a question, if you click that little orange microphone beside your name, that will unmute your microphone and you can ask a question. I'll ask another question, Mark. Um, you know, you sure. by now you have experience with lots of different kinds and uh, kinds of cover crops and different species. Um, do you have any recommendations for if this was, uh, if someone just wanted to try something for the first time, yeah. where would you, where would you point them to start? Sure. I, my personal favorite that I had so much experience with is, is field bees and oats. I mean, it, it, you can, uh, it grows right away in the spring. It um, grows in a hurry. Um, you can take it down whenever you want. I mean, it can, and it, you know, the younger you do the oats, the more that even makes nitrogen from what I've heard. Um, it can also be, till strips out and plant your pumpkins in there and then later till the oats beside those pumpkins um, and put clovers in. Uh, I would say just always remembering that to let the biology to live in your soil, you always want roots in the soil. So, so very limited fallow times is kind of the key for any cover crop. So, so I mean, be always thinking, what's my sequence plan? You know, if it works out. Another easy one to 
start out with um, for gardeners and everybody is some rye in the fall. Um, especially, you know, if you if you can plant it a lot earlier, and if you're gardening, you don't have to wait till the whole garden tore up to um, go ahead and plant it. You can take out your sweet corn or whatever it was as it's, as it's ripe, and um, you know, work it up a little bit, and um, you know, you can still have a lot of cover, as Mark pointed out, and then grow a lot of these here um, here cover crops. Yeah, and then along with that, Terry, um, in your garden, doesn't matter if it's after your last cultivation of sweet corn or tomatoes or melons or squash or pumpkins, um, clovers, you know, scatter those clovers, irrigate it, you have a nice bed of clover to walk on the rest of the season. And there they'll grow back the next spring and, and just do wondrous things for your soil. I had a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Hello. Go ahead, Becky. Oh, okay. Um, I had a question regarding um, the white Dutch clover. If you had a uh, an apple orchard, what would be a good regimen to or to include the white Dutch clover into your planting? Sure. That's a very good point. You know, I personally, that's what's going to happen in our orchard this year. We'll just um, plant it, and then it will be a perennial year after year after year. So then we'll never even work it under. It'll it'll just be there continuously. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Hi. Hi, do you use cover crops in your high tunnels at all? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, um, yeah, a, couple, a couple years ago, we planted oh, canola. We did a lot of different ones. And, and the trouble is, of course, our high tunnel season ends mid-October. So, so they were planted late, and then we had a, a real cold, cloudy fall. So, so a lot of them didn't germinate, but they, they sure did the following spring. So we... We had we were pulling cover crop weeds the whole summer, so yeah. I mean, I I don't know, but to see cover crops in a high tunnel is such a beautiful idea. Um, and other than setting your high tunnel aside, I'm not sure how to do it aside for one season. But I, I would love to do it again. But I kind of learned the painful way that the way we did it wasn't very good. Some people have high tunnels on wheels and they move them and oh, wouldn't that be a beautiful chance to graze um, cover crops on the soil? Um, you know, you brought up a really good question. Though. We were thinking of um, doing one of our cover crop strips as alfalfa and then um, and then I, I know there's got to be a lot of choppers and wagons, um, hay lined out, out in the country and so we're Thinking of chopping up alfalfa, which is full of nitrogen, and working that into the soil of the high tunnel in the fall. And so that would be as good as having a cover crop in there where really you wouldn't have to grow it in the high tunnel. And so I, I think chopped alfalfa might be pretty cool. But Terry's a high tunnel expert. What would you think of that idea, Terry? You know, Mark, we actually been talking quite a bit about that too, and actually I'm looking at some research with that. And yeah, it, it is a really good idea. You're going to want to cut the alfalfa here just um, at first bloom, or actually before when you just see a couple of buds or a couple of blooms, um, you know, because right there it's got you know very very high nitrogen and um, and that sure. too. You know, and, and actually too, you can almost compost and not some of the exactly. alfalfa. Exactly. Yeah. We had a guy from um, Peru one year who was just a master at composting, and he would take a pile of weeds and cover them with plastic, and it would be the most beautiful soil in just a few days. You know, so if I could get him back, and I think composting it, like you said, would be an awesome idea. Actually, we're working with our state high tunnel conference is um, the 17th and 18th of uh, February. And we'll be talking, you know, quite a bit about some of them subjects there. Awesome. Yeah, I'll be there. Other questions? 
Mark, I have a question. Right. If, if we use cover crops in our garden and we shouldn't kill, what would be the cover crop and the best way of utilizing the nutrients? Right. See, that, that, that to me is the unanswered question. You know, because um, I love to till and I, I know how beautiful the soil is when you work a cover crop into it. And so, you know, this lady we listened to at the Minister of Organic, I mean, she's brilliant, but um, she doesn't have her own farm, you know, but she's brilliant, you know. Um, and, and I'd love to see her come on my, my hard tight soil and, and pull that up. Now, now Gary Zimmer, who is just an excellent person as well, as well as this lady, I wasn't downplaying her at all, said that you really can't ever do no-till like Rodale does with, oh, they have 8% organic matter because they cover crop, you know, forever, until you really do have decent cover uh, organic matter in your soil. So, so I'm thinking you are going to need to till it in. I mean, and so are we, but but if we can minimize it, like for example, if we can do no till drilling into like the Sudan grass patch, I mean, we walked away from the or Minnesota Organic Conference thinking, you know, we could do that and that would help our fall cover crop survive and we'd have one less tillage event. So, I mean, I think common sense has to enter in too with, with what we know because because I've, I've seen field bees and oats get worked into the soil, and I've seen the magic of the smell of the soil. I mean, and it can't be all bad, you know. So I'm so glad you asked that question. Now, could you do strip crops in your cover crop? It, um, just a pillar with? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Get the nutrients, wouldn't you, from the remaining cover crop? Yeah. Yep. I'm you know, and then what we'll all be doing is experimenting and seeing well, what is the best, what what works. It's it's so funny about farming. I mean, it is problem solving, and you're always thinking. I I once had a, a an intern on the farm, and he had worked in a. a uh, kind of an assembly line factory, and he said hey, his intelligence went down as, as his work there continued. And I said, well, you feel that way here, you know, because with our packing of the CSA boxes, that's a little bit like assembly line. And he said, oh, no, not at all, because we're always problem solving, you know, and that's what farming is. We're, we're thinking and wondering what's the best way to do it, and there is no one right best way, you know. Who, who knows what the best way is? And, each person's farm and situation is different than the other person. So, so you know, if, if we're cover cropping, I don't think you can do like anything wrong. I mean, I think whatever you do will be great. Okay, thank you. Good question. Any other questions out there? Don't be shy. Do you need to um, use, uh, do you put manure on your uh, soil or uh, uh, like a vegetable uh, a compost, say for a, for a small garden or do the, does the cover crop um, take care of uh, what you would normally use manure for? Yeah, you know, that is such a good question. Um, like what I learned this last week was, um, any extra fertilizer, you know, that's not needed just works against the biology. I'm I'm kind of leaning towards trusting the cover crop and the biology to do a lot of it. Um, oh, I was just reading a study about, um, oh, and you know, I just heard it this week. Uh, someone had grown a tree in a pot and they measured the weight of minerals that had been taken out of that pot um, after the tree had grown and it was like just ounces. It was just ounces, meaning 
what's mostly in the tree is what came out of the air. You know, it was the, the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen. I mean, isn't that something? And so I'm starting to believe and trust the fact that um, if you if you set it up for the biology to happen, um, you might add a little nitrogen, but I, I think even we've just overdone it in our agricultural world. We're just dumping it on and, and the effects of that are are horrible. So I've changed in my my thinking. However, you know what so what we do though, we are, we're using the growers philosophy where um we do um foliar feed with all the minerals, all the minerals, trace minerals, all of them that are needed, and we do put some on the seed. And and beyond that, other than possibly a little bit of Ammonium sulfate for nitrogen, really not much at all. And, I, and I'm probably wrong, you know, in doing that, but I I heard so much this week what happens to biology if we dump too much of the, you know, the fertilizer on. There's no need then for the biology, so the plant doesn't feed the biology, so the biology dies, and we just we kind of screw it up, you know? So where's that fine line? I mean, I don't know. You know, at the Moses Organic Conference, there was a 92-year-old man in, in the front row of one of the sessions, and he said, I've got a lot to learn, you know, and that's how we're going to end our career. Yet, we've all got a lot to learn, trying to figure out the delicate little tightrope dance called, called farming. One thing you do, too, is, is watch the plant, you know, what... What does the plant look like it needs? You know, um, and soil tests are okay as well. But but I think the power of biology, and I'm believing in it more and more. They're a very good question, and what how what a hard one to have a decent answer for. I think one thing you really need to realize, if your soil is in poor shape, which we have have an awful lot of that, you can't turn this around and really quick with just one cover crop, even though that helps. I mean, you're looking at a few years to really build that soil tree up. I'm so glad you brought that up. Absolutely. It's a gradual transition, isn't it? Very good point, Terry. Hi, Mark. This is Robin from Douglas County Extension. We have a question here in our office. Great. Um, what if you're starting in a pasture that has a field, whatever? How do you get started with a cover crop? I heard Terry say it takes a couple years to build that soil health. Um, do you till it first? What do you do to get started, like taking a pasture or um, an unused field and, and turning it into a production field? Right. Um, and you were asking, how do you um, get like a pasture into a production field? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. What What do you need to do? What do you need to do when you um, to put a cover crop in that? How do you prepare that field? Do you put a cover crop in it? How long before you put it in? Right. Sure. Um, usually, what people do. Um, is um, like if it's a pasture, they will they will spray it to kill the grass first. Um, and I, I'm not recommending spray, but that seems to work um, well. And then I would say if you want to snuff out weeds and build organic matter, I'd recommend oh maybe field peas and oats first, followed by um, probably buckwheat. Or if the soil is somewhat fertile, do Sudan grass. So dead grass isn't the champion if your soil isn't real fertile. Um, so but, but I think field peas, field, <laughs> field peas and oats are. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think that would be a beautiful way to introduce that back into production would be cover crops like that. Um, the trouble is if you just kill those grasses, they're going to keep growing. However, you know, Sudan grass or field peas and oats and all those things would snuff them out too over time. And then you wouldn't have to use a chemical either. Did that answer your question? I... Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Who 
Mark, I'd like to ask you about the calcium problem. Yeah. Do you have a non-chemical solution? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of great sources of calcium. We're we're getting this week, in fact, um, high calcium lime out of the, the Moorhead sugar beet plant. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And then um, you can also get like gypsum. You can even buy that in bags at Fleet Farm. And gypsum is is sulfur and um, calcium. Calcium sulfate, in fact, is what it is. Um, and and kind of the way you know if you need calcium, if you didn't do a soil test, it leaves your soil hard and tight. And I have sandy loam. Okay, well, sandy loam. You know, your soil's already pretty poor, so you may not, you know, need so much. Um, however, calcium does so many other things other than open up the soil. I mean, it is the traffic cop in the center of the intersection. Everybody thinks calcium alone governs pH, but all of the minerals, you know, have a big part in that. So it's not just calcium at all. It's, it's funny how calcium is so overlooked in agriculture, and, and yet um, it is, it's kind of like the mediator between biology and the soil and the plant. I mean, it's like, it's really something. Okay. Now, as, um, what was the first you said? High calcium lime? Sure. From, from any of the sugar beet plants. Um, but if you have just a small garden or something like that, then then gypsum would be a good one. Most farms are short in sulfur, you know, and and I would say vary the amounts. Try one part of your garden with more and one with less, and then the production would let you know which was right, and you can adjust from there in coming years. Yeah, I have two one-acre gardens. So oh, wonderful. Great. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, this is Robin at Douglas County again. We have a question about how adding that um, lime would affect the alkalinity of the soil. Um, if you have problems and your soil is highly alkaline, would you recommend gypsum instead? Right. Um, the, yeah, then. then you know, you probably wouldn't want to add lime. Um, I mean, I know close to Wisconsin, I think I've heard people say they have so much calcium in their soil, so they'd never add more. So in our area, we're definitely, we're fine, maybe we were low in calcium. So for us, that's an answer. But yeah, that's a very good point. You may be different where you are. There's a lot of people who are soil consultants, and I'm, I'm certainly, you know, not one of them. Mark, I'd like to ask a question. Sure. Um, I'm, I, first of all, I'm very excited about this presentation, and um, right. it's wonderful, wonderful, uh, encouraging news. How uh, likely is it that you will be sharing this with uh, some of the bigger farmers um, to try and help change these kind of practices yeah, in a more wide way? Good question. You know, yeah, I mean, I'm always willing to speak anywhere. I spoke at the Minnesota Organic last week on this and, and will next week at the Minnesota Fruit and Vegetable Growers. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's so possible for any farmer to work cover crops in, like um, cover crops could be seeded, you know, into corn like in August. Of course, it takes rain. We haven't had rain the last fall. It's because we're in the middle of a drought, but um, into corn or beans or, or anything and have this um, change, you know, change what's happening. I think. I think the more of us who do come across too, though, the more there'll be a grassroots movement. I know um, a lot of people, a lot of people go by our farm and had huge interest in 
what are those thrifts though and and so when they see our farm change hopefully that will be a catalyst in itself but yeah i know i'm i this is my mission in the last part of my life so so i i'd um i'd be open to anything It's kind of funny that we um, took part in the Quick Grant, which um, is supportive of cover crops. But um, we would have done it without that. Um, that they ran, they ran out of money, you know, so we didn't get it anyway. And it's like, well, you know, I don't, I don't need the government to um, do this because it's, it's right. But but the top farmer in our area got six million dollars, and they they had money for him on that, which is kind of funny, isn't it? Maybe that's not fun. <laughs> I, I think we have to. I think we have to realize that you know, looking at the economic situation here, um, if you people want healthy food or they want to grow healthy food or sell healthy food or buy healthy food, there's going to be more money involved than there is with doing it the old conventional way. Um, you know, you, you well, it's easier, you don't need as much equipment, um, fertilizer prices are really going to start going down with the cost of fuel, you know, which may just some of the people. So, I mean, you know, that's why when people go to farmers markets and they got to put a plug in for that or CSAs, you know, the real question is that as a farmer, how, how he farms or she farms. And, you know, that's going to answer a lot of your questions on the healthfulness of the food. It's a very good point. Beautiful question. Well, I have a few more minutes here. Like, yes, sir. Linda, are you back on? Yeah, I just um, I just want to let uh, folks who are online know we are recording this session. Um, we've recorded it using this WebEx. There's a kind of an internal recording. We'll also, uh, I hope we'll have a recording that is a little easier to edit so we can, um, you know, we can highlight a few of the things that Mark said. So that'll be available on the Moodle site. Um, I hope that those of you who are on have had a chance to check out that site. There are a number of other resources there. Uh, you just, um, you can check your email to uh, to find out how to access that Moodle site, you can also go to localfoods.umn.edu slash college, and near the top of that page is a link to that Moodle site. If, you're, uh, if you don't have a U of M email address, you'll need to create a guest account, and uh, those of you who have registered should have gotten information on how to access that. Uh, we'll put Mark's slides there. Um, as well as the recorded presentation, and you can uh, you can reference that. Uh, if there's something you want to go back and hear what what he had to say. You can listen again. I agree with lots of others who have uh, who have thanked you, Mark, for the information you've shared. I think uh, this is this is really inspiring, and I'm glad you you connect the dots so directly for us saying that, you know, if you can get this much nitrogen in your soil without going through the process of uh, using natural gas and, uh, you know, trucks and everything to, to get it delivered, uh, you know, this helps in so many ways. The, the biology, active biology really doing the job. So yeah. I appreciate your comments. Oh, well, you're welcome. Thank you. Yes. Well, if there's no other questions, I think we'll just kind of shut it down for tonight and thank Mark again for his excellent, um, not only his presentation, but all the research of his own that he's really shared. Um, we gain, um, I'll, I'll gain some out of it. Great. I'll unmute everyone and we can applaud his, uh, <laughs> show him our appreciation with a round of applause. Oh, yeah. Thank you.